Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Good to see you here. I'm Nancy Allen. I'm the CEO for the Commercial Board of Realtors Michigan, and we're happy to have you here and uh, participating in our commercial uh, track for the day. I'm pretty excited uh, to uh, introduce you. I'll let them tell, uh, tell you about themselves um, once we get started, but excited to introduce you to Ellie Mahoney and Trey Little, and I think this is gonna be a little bit different from the typical Con Ed classes that you participate in. Uh, participate in. So, should be a little bit of fun, too. Um, and the, uh, there's a theme. <laughs> you can't see, there's a theme. It's all about by the block. Actually, we're also, someone just, just asked me um, two questions I wanna clarify that for you. This is a Con Ed class even though somehow it appears to not be stated as such on the, on the handout. It is a Con Ed approved class for one hour. Um, and uh, somebody asked me what the class was about. You're gonna see what it's about, but what I want you to focus on from the commercial real estate aspect is that this is all about mentoring. We're gonna tell you a really cool story, but it's about mentoring in the commercial real estate industry, which we all know is very different than uh, the residential. So having that, uh, said that, I'd like to introduce you to Trey Little and Ellen Mahoney. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, this is this is a presentation that's very near and dear to my heart. I've been in commercial real estate for 39 years. I started out as a paralegal running a title company in New York, and then I moved here and I was with some big firms as a commercial real estate paralegal, I got, I got kudos of experience. Then I moved into the mortgage business, and eventually I moved back into title and ran a title business for a few years. And in 2015, I just went and got my broker's license. Never sold real estate before. Uh, from there, I opened up the first and only Remax commercial office in southeastern Michigan. So, still the only. <laughs> but from there, I also opened up a second office recently that does residential and commercial with only one purpose in mind. I do not want to manage residential deals. I want to manage commercial deals. I spend a lot of time, most of my time, if I'm not selling, mentoring. And I think it's really, really important when you try to move into the commercial arena You've got to understand what you might be getting into. And I'm going to in let Trey introduce himself. He spends a lot of time with me. We, we are on the road together. He's next to me in my office. He listens to my conversations. He meets my clients. He gets mentoring from some of my clients. I do mostly redevelopment in the city. My territory is Detroit. That's where my new office is. And I still have an office in Oakland County. And I have an agent who came to me 14 years of experience in 2017, and she's still learning. And we still spend sometimes an hour on the phone just discussing objections or trying to negotiate deals. So I want you to hear from Trey, so he can kind of elaborate on his story, and then we'll go do some back and forth. Okay, um, that was a good introduction. So one of, the, one of the things I like about Ellen is that she is really good at the deals, really good at the contracts, really good at the business and know it so well. And I see her walk into a room quiet, humble and meek, and people don't know what to think. And then once she says what she knows about what we're doing and what her experience alone, people jaw drop. And I'm just like, I just know, right? So when I see how people respect her everywhere we go, I'm like, okay, she's perfect for me to learn from. Because for me, when we first met, we had a brief conversation. We was on the east side of Detroit. I'm like, what is this woman doing on the east side of Detroit, right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm chilling in a coffee shop, and I'm like, I'm like, hold on. But it was instant respect. But it, it was instant respect. I'm like, okay, she here. She like shaking everybody's hand, talking to everybody. I was like, okay, cool. I can, all right, I like this. So then I was like, what's your name? Where you from? What you doing over here? It was like the five questions, and like she answered all of them, and she wasn't intimidated by it. So I'm like, I like her. So then she asked me about what I do, and then I told her that I was doing a lot of fundraising on the east side of Detroit, trying to help the youth. I was in cryptocurrency, and one of the things I did after traveling, I was in a rock band, and I was a rapper in a rock band, but I learned a lot about business and meeting people all around the country. So I grew up in Detroit, grew up in poverty, 
And when I grew up in the streets of Detroit, it was hard. I had a, a single mom and she taught me a lot about like survival, surviving on little and having that grit and that grind to, to survive life. So then you combine that with going on the road with this band and I started meeting people from all over the country. And then we started traveling to different parts of the world. So when I came back to Detroit, I was like, okay, there's a lot of people here that want to see the city improve, but they don't have the infrastructure, the money, or if they do, they don't, a lot of the people don't have the knowledge of how to do it, or if they have the knowledge, they don't have the resources. So I said, okay, maybe I can be someone who knows the city really well, the parts that people don't know, and connect with people who want to come back and help. So when I met Ellen, it was the perfect time, and she basically said, you would be good at real estate. And I was already thinking, I said, what are two ways that the world is impacted or two ways that people make money is stocks and real estate. So when I got really good at crypto, I bought some Ethereum and you know, I know it was a lot of coins that people was like, I'm not getting into this. So people stuck with the S and P 500. I got in, put a lot of money in it and made some good money. And I was like, okay, now I want to get into real estate, but I don't know anything. So when I met Ellen and realized she was really good at it, she was showing me step by step and commercial real estate was my first step into real estate. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So when I got into commercial real estate, she started showing me that it was really about mentoring, making those connections. Like everybody want to make money. That's the goal. But you make money by really making a difference and doing these big developments and helping people open businesses and making dreams come true. And I look at the clients that come to her, they trust her. And it made me really see that it's really all about the people and making those dreams come true. So it's a long process, it's not a quick flip, and we sit and work on contracts for months after months after month. And then that's where the grit and grind come in, and I'm like, oh, we have a lot in common. So where I come from, you have to have this grit and grind. And even in commercial real estate, with it being a long process, you can work on a deal for so long and see it fall apart. So I seen how Ellen was handling it, and that's when I knew, okay, I'll be a perfect fit. So step by step, I've been learning so much about helping the people, listening to them, and once you close that deal, it really springboards you forward. So that was my experience in getting into real estate and taking it with everything that I learned growing up in Detroit. So that's what really helped me meeting somebody that can really help me channel that energy and everything that I was trying to do. So um, I'm here for, for knowledge. How many people have sold a real estate property that was commercial or leased? Wow, is there anybody here that just does commercial work? People. Um, I only do commercial work, but I will tell you um, the market in Detroit is different than any market in the country. Mm -hmm. And I've talked a lot about that. I, you know, I'm part of a REMAX network, so we have big symposiums every year, and I usually get up and, and try to give you know, some information about this market because it's unique. And I, I truly believe you have to build from the bottom up. So I would encourage anybody considering it to start in the leasing sector and I have one of my agents here and that's pretty much where where she is right now um, she just got she's got a couple listings of buildings but you have to understand both because nobody's going to just you know build a property that's not going to get leased right it's it's all about the the dollars so that's where I would encourage everybody to start but that whole transaction um, from ground up, especially acquisitions, is dangerous. Because one little mistake can be worth a million or more dollars. So I think it's, it is smart to get educated and you know get the classes, but I think it's even smarter to be able to follow transactions with somebody who knows what they're doing and who can hold your hand and give you the right advice. So like I said, I work with people who have a lot of experience and they still, you know, we still bat a lot around. So if you don't have a commercial broker, if you at least have somebody in the office who's been in the industry a while, that, that would be the best way to start. So Trey um, is, bought, has bought a property and I'm gonna let him expand on that a little, but he, he started pretty much from the bottom. He, he bought a land bank home with four lots, so technically a, a five unit-ish, so you know, it's, it's commercial. And I have developers in neighborhoods that I represent that have been really, they, they have more experience and they're able to um, help Trey sort of understand 
uh, how, how this works. Because you know, if you're in commercial, you don't buy one property. You, you have to move and pivot around the community, especially in the neighborhood that's you know pretty much impoverished. So I have one client that is buying, um, she's bought a house and she turned it into condos, four units, with the idea that she was going to sell these units so people could have homes in that area. Well, that jumped away from her with an Airbnb. <laughs> she's getting so much money from Airbnb in these units. And there, there weren't, you know, the buyers just weren't there, unfortunately, with interest rates going up as you go to the market. So now she is gonna hold that property, but she's doing a commercial development down the street on a main corridor, which is going to be a hub. And she's going to be um, sponsored by the NFL, who will be in Detroit next year. So that's her mission. We're trying to get it bought from the city and get it developed in time for the draft. And the NFL has agreed to sponsor it because she said to them, you know, the boys that play football and go to the NFL do not grow up in the Central Business District of Detroit. They grow up in this neighborhood. Yep. And they just, they, they did it. They, she pitched it and, and they're coming. And I mean, it's, it's so inspiring. And Trey was with little Sean recently. Big Sean. Big Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Different world than me. <laughs> That's going to go viral right there. It's a little baby. Yeah, little Big baby, little baby. <laughs> God, I get my rappers mixed up. Okay. But anyway, tell them what, what happened with Big Sean. So, so basically, I've been, I've been introducing her to like all these people and like, you know, she's like, okay, I see. So one of the things about me is having mentors is key and essential because I have the idea. I'm the visionary. I'm the person that's like, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do this. And then you got Ellen like, well, what does that mean? Like, how can you practically do that? So if I say, I'm going to impact Detroit and connect the neighborhoods with downtown, well, practically, how are you going to do this? So that's why we balance each other out. And then I'll say, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And she'll say, this is what you're missing. So when I decided to say, I'm going to revitalize the neighborhood that I grew up in, in 2020, I stopped touring as an artist. We were doing these big festivals, tens of thousands of people. And it slowed down for me. So my sister sent me a link to a house that I grew up in, and it was on sale for $1,000. But like I said, I didn't know anything about real estate. So I missed out on buying this house that I know everything about. I know about the neighborhood because I didn't have the experience or knowledge. So when I met Ellen, and then she introduced me to all the people that she know that she deals with, I went in not as a traditional developer with money and capital to buy and develop, but not having a lot to do this and no experience but then buying a house and then afford lots qualified me to have people, you know, interested. So when I started bringing investors over, they were like, no, this is too risky. We're not going to make any money. So then I kept asking those questions of how can I do this? So over time, I started really telling the story about why I want to develop this and how I want to do it. So the brand has become worldwide. So people are buying the shirts to support the project. So I said, okay, investors think this is too risky. The whole neighborhood is abandoned. I only have five pieces of property. It's gonna take at least 50 to 100 properties before you can make some money off of this. It's gonna take up to 10 years to see any return. So I'm like, I have to make this something that's more of a, a mission and vision instead of just an investment project. And people are getting on board, people are donating, people are buying shirts all around the world. I'm getting interviewed by I'm doing a TED talk, I just did a Fox interview. I'm getting interviewed by all the major outlets because they're curious. And I'm doing this development while learning it and holding hands of people who know how to do this stuff. People who already develop blocks. And getting that experience is important to have people around you that can say, okay, you have this vision and you know what you want to do, but let me help you walk through that. So I wouldn't necessarily encourage everybody to try a buy the block campaign. That's an untraditional route, which is working, but um, most developers don't do that. Most developers have to figure out how to get enough capital to get a, a deal done and off the ground and developed. And it is hard right now. With interest rates, you know, in close to 8% just on commercial deals. I just had one of my clients, she had an SBA lined up with only 10% of her own money. They were gonna do everything from acquisition, construction, <laughs> F&E, &E, which is furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and startup costs. Well, they've pulled back on her. She's a first-time developer, but she's she's very bright. She's run, she does um, contracts for big suppliers, billions of dollars of contracts that she negotiates. But 
Anyway, they pulled away from her so badly that she's only getting the acquisition loan and a little bit of the construction loan, and she has to come in with 30% of her own money. It's, a, it's at least a $5 million deal. So that went from 10% of $5 million to 30% of $5 million. So right now we're out trying to raise capital with other investors because it's like, it's one of the only ways. The other way is to use the Community Development Investment Funds, CDIFs, which are, I think in other communities, I just happen to be familiar with Detroit's. CDFI. They, um, what they'll do is they'll provide another layer of financing. So we call it the capital stack. You start with a primary lender, then you go to maybe a CDFI, and I'm telling you, sometimes you go to three more layers. I've even seen a deal that was nine layers because you just need to get the money to get this thing off the ground. Um, I haven't seen a, a, a big failure yet, but I've seen things delayed like for years in terms of getting that, the money. And then the other alternative is grants, and the other alternative can be um, tax credits. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's a complicated process. So Trey, is, we're just at the bottom right now. He's gone in with a team of helpers that cleaned out the property to make it a little bit more easier to envision you know, what, the con what the construction is gonna be, what's gonna be required. We've gotten a few bids from contractors I happen to know that work that neighborhood. But you know, the process itself is, is uh, it can be, it, well, it's going to be painful. There's just, <laughs> there's just no two ways about it. And it's not straightforward. It's not like he's got, oh, okay, this is how I'm going to get a tenant in here, or, you know, and trying to do a pro forma in a neighborhood where your rental rates are, are real low and your construction costs are really high. So it's, this is a learning experience of, you know, of a magnitude I'm not used to seeing. But. And I want to add on that really quick. One thing that, that drew me into commercial real estate is because I can do multifamily, single family houses all day, but the neighborhood that I'm investing in and developing in, there's a grocery store, there's liquor stores, there's gas stations, nothing else, right? So in order for that neighborhood to come back, you can have families there all day, but there's no money in the neighborhood, there's no jobs in the neighborhood, and it takes commercial real estate to build a foundation, to add to that ecosystem and to keep dollars in the neighborhood and bring it in the neighborhood, right? <laughs> So if there's people with jobs in the neighborhood, it reduces you know, the crime rate, right? Or there's people that don't have to leave the community in order to work. So this is how you build the foundation in the neighborhood. Apartment buildings, senior living, things like mom and pop clothing shops, restaurants from the people in the neighborhood is what will keep people um, wanting to be invested and have pride in the neighborhood. So I'm gonna have to transition into commercial to really bring this up and to bring the value of the neighborhood up. And that's where people like Ellen come in to help me do this because this is a foreign concept to me. So, but it's important commercially. It is important because like I said, it brings the capital, it brings the money, it brings jobs and it's necessary. Yes. So a question what per, for, for you on what percentage of this business, um, like this business, this is a long time coming. There's, there might not be many commissions involved because you're dealing with dilapidated properties. You're spending, you know, a year or two on this. What percentage of your business, you know, you got to make a living too. Is, um, you know, is like this 20% of your business because you care about the community or are you spending 90% of your time on this stuff? Because oh, I, yeah. I, I, I like, yeah. I, I have the same heart, but um, I only do 10% of it. Yeah, no, I am, um, I've got properties for sale with the sales side is, is tough right now. I got a lot of properties for sale and I've got a 58 unit that's $12 million. Got any buyers? Um, it's, it's a fabulous deal. It's 100% occupied. It's, it was built in 2017, so it's relatively new construction. It's in Midtown near the DIA and you know a nice side of town that needs, um, needs love, but it's getting love because this guy's got another development if we can sell this one. And he's also got a four and a quarter loan, interest only, 15 more years with the NEZ, which means he's not paying high taxes right now. So um, yeah, seven so, million of it would be through loans. So that's we really need. 200,000 a unit? Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. It's, no, it's not that. <laughs> anyway, um, but to, 
to move over to what is another development the same guy has. He's got a hole in the ground right now. He's, in, he's been trying to raise capital and, and get financing for two years. And he's had to change contractors because a lot of these contractors are, are busy and it's hard to get them and the numbers don't necessarily work. So you're, you're fighting for your life out there. Contractors uh, to do, you know, the work, you know, they we need. Uh, said I. And sorry, my name is Terrence Bowers, the uh, president of Detroit Association of Realtors. So yeah, this they're We could not hear you. Well. Thanks for the question, Terrence. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know how you how you get contractors. Well, you always get multiple bids. Um, I think in Detroit, you got to know who the big players are. Oh, okay. <laughs> they, <laughs> sorry. Basically, I just wanted to see what your recommendation was and we're going about getting contractors for these bigger projects because it's been very difficult, especially since COVID with this, uh, materials going up in costs and um, also contractors, you know, being busy, like you said um, a little too earlier, and being consistent and actually like pricing out, you know, the actual work right, the money up front sometimes, you know, you, front the money and then they go about it, use that money for another job or so. So it's like, how would you recommend going about getting contractors for these bigger projects? Get someone licensed because they okay, have to. Well you gotta, first of all, you gotta have a general contractor. He absolutely is good at what they do and committed and has their own subs so that they can control that. I would never start a project without my funding, which is the acquisition and the construction side of things. I mean, if they get, if you've got a big project, you know, they're hungry for it. We've got, you see our cranes, we've got lots of cranes going on up there. So it is happening and you, I guess you need to know who the players are. Detroit, the toughest thing is trades. Um, you know, the labor is expensive. The trades are, are, you know, scarce. So that's why it's so expensive. So it all feeds on each other. But, um, you know, I know my guy's been sitting on this project. He's, he's had at least, two or three contractors that have wigged out on him because he doesn't have his funding. And I had another deal in Brush Park, which is a, a you know, very hot, sought after area, where we were all already signed a lease with probably the biggest restaurant in the city, who's going to take up all the retail, it's over 10,000 square feet there. Um, and that project, oh, this poor guy, it's his first development. My, he's not my client, I represent the tenant. But he's, um, He's had to go through, I don't know how many lenders. He's finally supposed to get the money by October 15th, which means we'll finally get paid. Um, but it is, a, it is a very big lease, and he's, you know, he, it's been painful for him. Just utterly painful, and it's a ground up construction deal. So again, the same thing, you know, who's gonna build it? So question, are there certain meetings that you need to attend? Are there certain meetings that you need to, a person needs to attend like something that the city has regarding planning or organizations of that offer information about that so you would know to help you with your strategy. Well, it, there is a process. If you're gonna you know, build something, you have to get uh, site plan approval. Often that takes four to six months minimally. So you have to engage you know, your architects and, and those people early on. But um, uh, Trey and I often uh, attend these meetings um, with the Real Estate Association of Developers that's mostly um, minority who are mostly, some are inexperienced and some are very experienced and they bring in a lot of good experts to help, you know, help people through that process. So you can link into some of the, I think resources are my bread and butter, right? I mean, it's, uh, I'm always having to refer to resources, because I don't. I'm a broker. I don't do all this other stuff. I just watch <laughs> the process. Push it through. What's the name of that developer group? It's called Reed. R E A D. Yeah, they meet once a month, um, and they're doing a tour next month, which is always fun, because you get to see some of the work. Um, so I'm going to be representing 
one of the developers in Midtown who's got retail on the bottom and is 100% occupied with his apartments already. So that's exciting. And they've got another development over in New Center that's even bigger that's got more retail I'm going to be representing. And they're not quite built out yet, but they're in the process. But that's how I make a living. I just keep going. <laughs> Are there other questions? How much of your business comes from your service to the community? And is that something that you found has helped to drive business towards you? Um, and being you, or if not, where are most of your um, clients coming from? So for me, I'm still, <clears throat> I'm still, like, I'm really new to real estate and I'm still getting into it. And I've only had the about a block business for about, I think it's only been like six months. So it's taken off pretty fast, right? So I would say it's more of a startup right now. Just got the LLC. Like I said, in six months, just got the property in like four months. So it's only been four months to that. So everything is moving so fast. It's more of like I'm pouring into it. And it kind of goes back to the question that he asked earlier. I'm doing more pouring into it than I am getting anything out of it, right? And that's why I say I chose to do this development because I believe in it. And I know in the end, of course, it'll pay off, right? I'll make money from renting out, flipping, Airbnb, and, you know, doing different things in the community, right? Like starting a business and doing brick and mortar shops and commercial real estate. But as of now, I'm getting business of, uh, from other places. And this is more of a project that I'm doing to pour back into the community. So yeah. And Does somebody's encouraging him to get his license. Yeah, I'm working on that. I know that'll help a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my test a lot. They say it's different now, so I'm working on that too. But so. you don't need a license for commercial. Sure you do. Oh yeah, yes, you, do. you do. It's just the problem is the exam. And you don't need a license to be a commercial builder. Oriented. You have to have an architect. Oriented, which is why we're here today representing the Commercial Board of Realtors. <laughs> because it's, it's a disservice to the commercial you know, industry. And people like me, other you know, brokers in the industry, want to make sure we maintain some integrity. Because people think that you know, there are no rules. And trust me, you... you there are rules, they're just not always employed. <laughs> I'm the first to tell you, you know, there are some unscrupulous players out there and you better know how to protect yourself because sometimes the only way to protect yourself is to, um, to understand there's a you know, broker lien statute that was implemented way back when, but I remember when it came well, into place because ago, yeah. brokers weren't getting paid. So now, as long as you have the proper documentation, you can file a lien against somebody's real estate and sort of force the issue to get paid. Only on commercial. Yeah. Only on commercial. Mm. That goes all commercial. Yeah, it's not, it does not, well, because the, the residential people don't need it. They pay each other. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So the good thing is, is that they redevelop bad housing and turn it into good housing, but then the people that live there can't afford to live in the good housing. But you see why it works, and you see why investors are going to going to get into that scene. How do you how do you get the workforce housing? How do you build housing in your neighborhoods so that the people that want to work in Detroit or any place else in the world that can live in those neighborhoods? And and I don't know how you do that. I mean, I'm stumped. And, and we deal with the Airbnb. That's a, that's a really good question. So one thing that I'm learning through people like Ellen, 
there's things like subsidies, right? Government subsidies, and they actually help the people that, that, that want to live there, right? Because at the end of the day, yes, I do need to make money to bring the value of the neighborhood up, right? To bring the rental rates up, to bring the property value up. And if I have to charge $2,000 a month for rent, when I was growing up, we couldn't afford nothing like that. So it's like, how do I ask a lot of questions? How do I make this happen? How do I make this happen? And Ellen is one of those people that no matter what question I asked, she always, if she don't have an answer, she'll try to point me somewhere. Like I said, I'm a dreamer, but she'll say, okay, here are the numbers behind it. Here's how you make this happen. Here's what it would take to make, you know? So, and then I have people on my team that look at the financials and the numbers. So I try to aim high and then I try to look at the practical side of like, how can we do this, you know? And we go from there. I think in, in Trey's case, it, this is going to be organic. I mean, he's starting with, you know, five properties essentially and we know what the rental rates are in that neighborhood, and he may lose money on the first deal, hopefully at least break even, but hopefully it will encourage other developers to come into these neighborhoods and, and do, you know, do what they do. Some of them are affordable housing experts. I mean, it's, it's a perfect neighborhood for that, and people are doing better affordable housing these days. So um, I know there's some out in the outlying areas that I have a group of, a couple girlfriends who who are killing it. They're, they're doing a lot of we development in the market. We built 250 houses and in the city of Muskegon and sold them off. I can piggyback on what you're saying because I'm looking and you're saying you're only four to six months out and I'm looking at your site and you've got the Detroit News all over you, you've got TED Talk, I mean, you're, this, that's how you do it. Exactly. If you get the word out, what he's doing, it's a mission, the mission makes sense, you're mm -hmm. helping people, building up a city, and, and it seems like there's a lot of interest. So for four to six months, I have to give you kudos, dude, because you've you got, you got a lot going on. And like, are you doing, no, thank you. Are you doing proud for me? just gave me chills because I'm like, you, you get it. Because it's like, for me, it's real. It's raw and it's real. Because the one thing that I benefit from is I've learned that anybody who succeeds at everything has to have a strong mind. You have to be willing to continue to go when you know, you lose everything, you lose money, people turn it back on you. So some people aren't really willing to lose money, to lose people turning it back on you. In a project like this, you see that how hard it was to make it out of the neighborhood and okay, I wanna come back and redo it. But if it wasn't for the people that gave me the positive responses in the neighborhood, when I see the looks on people's faces to say, hey, if you pay me to show up and wash this house for you and live in it, put some drywall up, I will live in this house, I want to, I need this. When you see someone committed to do that, it moves me, right? When I see people from Switzerland ordering these shirts, I'm like, okay. And it, like I said, there hasn't been a month to where I said I can't do this anymore. And it's been grueling. I've been losing money. It's been one of those things where I'm putting so much time here and I could be making more doing other things, but that's why getting a license will help. So when I'm doing those transactions and those deals, I can invest some of my own money or use that to borrow money. But as of now, I'm getting positive feedback from the community. They love when they see corporations come in. I had Happy's and Savvy's Pizza Pull up on the block, I think it was the vice president, it was two of, two of the guys from the company, and they're like blowing up world, like they're going all over franchises all over the nation right now. So when they pulled up on the block, they seen all the people that I had standing out there. I had volunteers all from the suburbs, people from the neighborhood, and they got out the truck and they was looking around like, okay. And then once they seen everybody excited for the pizza, it was like, they started handing it out and you could see smiles on everybody's face. So Happy's and Savvy said, anything you need from me, let me know, come to me with the right plan and I got you, we'll give you whatever you need. And that's the kind of thing that keeps me motivated, you know? And just to add, this is a strategic neighborhood for Detroit, so there's money being poured, there's infrastructure being built. His block is gonna be dead-ended so the kids can play. I mean, this this couple is an million effort. Dollars. Yeah, they put a couple million dollars into yeah. the neighborhood. And so, I didn't know that, I found that out after, so you see what I mean? There's <laughs> things that are like, okay, I just heard, I read online and I, I was told that they're about to put $2 million into the sidewalks and into the main street and then I see it happening. And then I heard Big Sean donated half a million dollars into the Boys and Girls Club right on the corner. And he came back and publicly shouted out by the block on his Instagram. And it's like a ripple effect. And I'm like, okay, like, I, something's happening here, you know, so. <laughs> Something is happening it's here. Like, <laughs> so how do, how do, yeah, it's like a startup. <laughs> Any startup, that's how it is. You get into something you develop and then you, you you lose sleep, you lose hair, you lose all that, right? You lose weight, like everything. But once you believe in it and you start to see that it's paying off, that's why I'm, I'm sticking it So out. can we like, do you have crowdfunding where we can just invest $1,000 and maybe get the money back someday? I don't think anybody can make any promises, yeah. but sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a hard you got a question. development with that. 
Um, uh, another question. How important is a business plan for you? Um, okay. Yeah. One thing about me, these and Fs all the way up until I graduated high school, if I'm being honest, right? I had, like, I struggled with formal education. I wasn't interested. I was bored. I wanted to get out and get my hands dirty. So when someone says, you need a business plan, you need a performer, you need to write this and write this, and I'm like, ah, can I, can I talk it out and somebody transcribe it? We got chat, like, that's how I am, right? So I got, we got chat GPT, thank God. Like, that's one of my, like, I, and then I can read through that and say, okay, and then, you know, get the grammar correct, spell correct, all this stuff, right? But I know what I'm talking about. I got the, the vision for it. And then I have people on my team that are really good at writing performers and business plans, and they believe in my mission and my vision, so they'll write something according to, what, according to what I believe in, we'll talk over it, and then we'll submit that. But that's the thing that separates a lot of people from get, becoming successful and not is that business plan. Because for me, people always ask for it, and I'm like, okay, I'll get back to that. Never do. So once I have someone say, saying, I'll do the business plan, I'll do the performance, it's a game changer. Have you started that? I ha yeah, I have. And it's, it, it looks good. You know, and the people that's helping me with it, they developed it. and. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's people that believe in what I'm doing, right? There, I have an accountant friend who works for the government that said, I want to help and volunteer my time. I have a lot of people volunteering their time that are really good at what they do. People that are excelling <laughs> at their professions, you know, CFOs and presidents of companies saying, I'll volunteer my time to help you with this. And that's why. So we've been getting approved for a lot of different things just because of the business plan. Well, you got accepted uh, almost, you applied mm -hmm. to Capital Impact Partners. Oh. I almost made it through. I made it to the final round, so yeah. I have to. I had to get in my feelings when I didn't make it. But I'll go back and ask, like, hey, what was it? Give me the criticism. Give me the feedback. Because right. I made it to the third round. Y'all love everything about it. And what was it? What can I work on to move forward? So. Okay, Mark. Have a question. Thank you. Um, and I'm very impressed. Um, Ellen, you mentioned earlier about an apartment building that you have for sale, where the owner has a very low interest. Would that rate be assumable with the purchase? Yes, the rate is assumable with the purchase. Oh. Interest only payments. <laughs> and it was taken out in 2021. We have units? all due diligence. Okay. How many units? 58. All full. What's the address? 710 East Ferry Street, Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? F E R R Y? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Premier Street in the city, by the way. I'll, I'll try to talk loud so everybody can hear. All right, All right I am going to get to a question, but first I want to just say Who I are love you? the alternative methods of the financing and, and, and being able to be creative and keeping that vision. That, I mean, that's the most important thing because people will follow the vision. And I just wanted to share a quick story. Um, I have volunteered at, at a nonprofit in my, in my neighborhood that I grew up at and chaired the board took over chairmanship of the board in 2016, and that's a nonprofit focused on health, um, housing security, and food security. Um, very wide range, but um, the founder was aging and getting ready to retire, and we really had to set it on uh, the organization on good footing. So I took over as chair with the vision to try to um, buy the block <laughs> from the absentee landlord that was in Washington, D.C., that, um, that had let the entire building deteriorate. We were the last sole tenants in this, um, you know, 30,000 square foot um, building that was really nine buildings all smashed together. And we applied twice trying to go through creating that capital stack is no easy feat, especially when you're trying to do affordable um, and, and mixed use, especially because mixed use doesn't fit into the LIHTX of the world, um, at least under MISHTA, you know, standards. And so we twice failed at a lie tech application. And it takes $120,000 to put one of those together. Yeah. And, um, and, and, but people believed in us and we, we were able to, to get a new, a new market um, tax credit to make the deal happen. Brought in a federally qualified health clinic to be on site, a pharmacy, a food co-op, um, all, all, the, all these people that were buying into that vision. Um, and so that we could help make it happen. We, had, we ended up having 52 individual funders. That was a constant roller coaster up and down to make it. And, but it's done, we made it, and we had a few, uh, you know, lots what's, of ups and downs throughout that What's process. the address of your property so we can look it up? 
Uh, the address of the property is it's a 1600 block of East Kalamazoo Street in Lansing, Michigan. Um, so if you look up Allen Neighborhood Center in Lansing, Michigan, um, it's it's the entire 1600 block of the the um, of, of the of, of the north side of the block there. Um, and uh, but I wanted to get back to kind of tail on one of the questions. So I just wanted to give you the kudos that you know, you've got to you, you that just got to keep going with it. I'd love to talk to okay. you further. What's about your it. name? Uh, my name is Jonathan Lum. I'm with uh, I'm a broker owner of Exit Realty Home Partners in Lansing, Michigan. And this is the stuff I do on my side, if you, you know, because I'm not busy enough managing 50 agents. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but I wanted to get back to how do you do it? How do you build affordable housing? I mean, that's the I mean, it's a million dollar question um, because it's so hard. Um, and I think even post COVID. Yeah, I mean, post COVID, you know, even though prices have come down on materials off their highs, um, you know, we in our area, and I believe this is probably true throughout the Midwest, is that we we have a serious lack of skilled trades and people going into the trades. You know, post uh, when No Child Left Behind laws went into uh, act went into effect in the 2000s, we lost all of our CTE programs. We my high school went from 33 CTE programs down to three that qualified under under the guidelines for graduation. And just now we're restarting them, but that's 20 years without encouraging people in there. And there's a foundation in town, Mikey 23, the, um, the foundation that does, that is isn't trying to get people on an individual basis. So I, I guess my question is, are there, are there, is there an effort in your area to try to get more people into the trades to try to, try to help make these visions happen? Sorry about my. No, that, that was. I didn't get to hear that. That was good. That was it's really increasing. Good. Oh, that was really Gen good. Z are like, we don't want the college debt. The Gen Z. Yeah. I have a twenty-year-old that said, "Screw this college debt." Well, they, they and should, all but I'm going to give like, you another option because I have some developers off off the East Coast that have linked into the prison system for felons who need housing, and they pay two thousand dollars a month rent, which in our market is very high. So I'm trying to sell them. I've got a, a portfolio so they can develop, you know, 80 to 100 units, and and they're going to use uh, hard money. And I'm figuring these hard money lenders are busy right now, and they will lend. But you don't want to sit on a hard money loan more than you have to because of the, you know, it's bad. The rates are horrible, but. If it gets the job done and you're not sitting on a property, not able to get going and developed, it might not be a bad option as long as you have the resources to get it built. Yeah? Hi, Ellen. Uh, my name is Deirdre. I'm from up by uh, Traffic City. And um, I started my adventures in commercial in 2019. And this is the first year I got to finally put down all the residential. So, yay. Yay. Oh, yay. Good for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, but my question is, is um, because of the way our market was up there, I had to find my own way as far as finding clientele. And um, so a lot of my clients were those first time, you know, commercial buyers. And um, my background uh, previous to real estate was in ICU nursing. So <laughs> education was a good thing for me. So I went out and found, um, you know, when they needed to find extra money, I found the economic development corpse and all that sort of stuff. I was lucky to have a broker that was good at holding my hand and did that. But unfortunately, in our region, not every county has an economic de development corp, or they don't necessarily fit the profile for what is needed from Michigan's economic development corp. And so, especially this year, I've had to go out and find or help them find that hard money or the private investors or that kind of thing, especially when I'm selling them something across the bridge. Um, and it's getting, I find that it's a bigger and bigger challenge and I just don't know if there's something else that I'm sort of like missing. Well, I would, I would encourage you to call the MEDC in Lansing because I just met a woman from there and I told her the same thing because there are regions that they don't have the um, DDAs. So, you think that there's an argument for that, I would call, they have money right now. You know they do. You just got to find it. It's, yeah. Thank you. Do you have the shirts here today to sell? So that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked. So, <laughs> yeah, so I have a limited amount with me and 
So I have a limited amount. Yes, I do. And at the same time, you can go on the website. So it's bodyblockdetroit.com. And I press them up. I have a team that press them up, and we get them out right away. We sign them, we number them, and it's a whole statement that come with it to show how people buying the shirt goes towards making this happen. So, yeah, but I have a limited amount. I'll be out here afterwards. How much early? What was that? How much early? Um, so it's a hundred dollars per shirt. I know that's a lot, but it does help like maintain a property, keeping the grass cut, and because I'm out there volunteering the time. So people that buy the shirts, that's how I make this happen. Until we can start generating revenue. We are buying the shirt. I want you to know that. We're buying you. Like, buying you <laughs> no, thank you. Buying the vision. And that's what my business partner told me. He said, or my mentor, he said, it's not just about the shirt, but it's about buying into the mission and what I'm doing. So, and like I said, it's people that's buying it that, that's making it happen. Shout out to the mayor. Shout out to Mayor Doggins. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, see. This is not a question, this is a testimony to Ellen. Ellen has been my mentor for many years. If there were more brokers, commercial or residential like her, who were willing to step forward and mentor other people. Ellen has mentored me on commercial deals. She's never turned me away. She's never turned my questions away. She has helped me put deals together. She is genuine and true. So I had to stand up to say that. So she's just not talking to talk. She walks the walk. Yeah. yeah. I wanna say, one of the things I want to say about that is that what Ellen did for me changed my life, right? It, it really did change my life because she's seen the vision. Like I said, when she stepped into the east side of Detroit, she took a risk, right? Doing that walking around, shaking hands. <laughs> but, I'm a diehard badass. <laughs> but at the same time, like, when she met me, she was like, there's something about him. And she didn't know that my history of traveling and working with people from Shinola and all that, because I was, I was chilling, I was low key. But it was something that she felt like, hey, if I give him a chance, it's going to do something. And being around her helped me have the vision and keep that vision of going back to buy property in this abandoned neighborhood that I grew up in. And all this stuff that's happening is because she took the time to do it. If it wasn't for her doing it, I probably would have felt like I couldn't make it happen. So it's taking chances. Even for me, I do the same thing. Every opportunity I get to see a fire, some young kid that need help, I make sure I take that time to do it. If they're serious, if I give them a test and they take it, I continue to do that. And like she's changing so many lives throughout Detroit. And millions of people watch my videos. I forgot to mention that. So I'm on TikTok. Millions of people watch my videos every day. So millions of people's lives are being changed by what I'm doing, all because she took that chance to go up and say, I'm going to pull him up and help him. And, and plug him in and help him get some opportunities. That's why I call her the plug. <laughs> I also call Brave Heart at times because I go on top of big buildings and stand on roofs. But um, what was I going to say about? What did you just say? <laughs> Take a chance. Take a chance and step out in. Yeah. Um, got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it'll come back. Everyone, we are getting close to time for the end of the class, so I would recommend if you've got a question you want to ask Trey, we should do that now. Let's see if the mayor will come up. Um, I'm coming over. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what I wanted to say was about Trey and how he is going to hopefully influence other young people to take a chance in these neighborhoods and help build them up. And we have a wonderful mayor that is encouraging people like Dolores McKinney and doing things for, for some of these developers that you know are, are going to really make people's lives better. Uh, this is, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Uh, Terrence Bowers again, Detroit Association of Realtors. Um, this is for Trey specific. Uh, being from the city, I got an appreciation for that, of course, like I'm from the city, seven mile Livernois area off Warrington. And the thing that we, that I've had a challenge in regards to you know real estate in general um, is getting how should I say it? it's the right folks in front of people to educate them on how to go about even starting you know what I'm saying like it's it's one thing when folks reach out to me in regards to like you know just want to learn the business and stuff too but like for instance commercial specifically using it as a business um, utilizing it for like the betterment of their communities and things of that nature I hear a whole bunch of people in regards to different projects that they want to be a part of and stuff like that, but they don't know what to do, where to go, LLCs, anything in regards to even the knowledge about any of that, you know what I mean? So it's um, 
for instance, at WCCD, I got a former dean on um, our uh, board of directors, and we're actually establishing a class for the associate's degree in real estate at the actual Wayne County Community Campus on the west side, right? So on the west campus. So it's things like this that we're trying to like you know integrate, so folks that are in school can start learning about this because we don't learn about none, like none, none of this of stuff. Us. Like for real, man. If, <laughs> unless you're in finance or something in college and stuff, do you go yeah, uh, mm -hmm. over? If you're blessed enough to be able to afford, yeah, you know. So I just wanted you know your take in regards to even what we can do on the ground. Because I'm in Detroit, I'm in these different streets. I'm on the east side, west side, northwest. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm everywhere. But at the same time, though, we put on financial literacy seminars mm -hmm. that throughout the city of Detroit, utilizing different churches. But at the same time, it's the youth, like the the targeting aspect. I'm 27. Like you know, at the same time, like there's other folks that are my age and younger that are have this passion. Yeah. So what would your, be your recommendation to even getting them started, getting in front of the right folks, especially in regards to commercial real estate? Because folks don't talk about that. It's one thing to flip a house, and another thing to mm -hmm. actually start a business. I'll say, like what you just said, it starts with the youth. And that's one of my specific focuses. So during the school year, I speak to about two to 300 students each week and go into different schools all around Detroit. Because a lot of the students, they want to have an opportunity to do something good to impact their neighborhood. They want to get into real estate. They want to get into business, but they don't know how. Someone showed me how to do Battle Block LLC. I went on YouTube and they said, look it up on YouTube. Started this LLC. It's becoming worldwide and people are supporting one of the biggest things that ever happened in my life. Just because somebody said start an LLC. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know it was $20, right? $25. <laughs> and just because I didn't know how, that slowed me down for years. But once I did it, it changed my life, right? So if you show somebody, here's how you buy a house. You do a, a, a class in a classroom, you show them how to do it, you know, 100 students, 20 might listen, them 20 might get out and really do some damage, right, and really create something. So that's why I spend a lot of time with the students, because they want to learn, they want to get into business, and that's all it takes, is showing them the practical steps, you know? Yeah, the conversation changed. Well, I think um, there are a lot of parents that need more financial literacy training than their kids. Because right. once you get them with more confidence in managing a budget that is so, you know, bare bones, they may encourage their kids more because I've worked in the schools too and I've talked to a lot of the principals and they say the parents don't support the kids' efforts. They're, they're so beaten down that they can't encourage them. So it really starts there and then, you know, and I know they're talking about putting financial literacy in the curriculum in the Detroit schools and all the schools really, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. All right, this is going to be our last question, but Trey will be here the rest of the day probably up mingling around this area so you can find him if you have additional questions. Uh, Ellen as well, all right? Thank you, everyone. Good job. One more question. <laughs> Real quick, um, I'm a broker, a real estate broker in Detroit, but I'm also a HUD approved housing counselor. So we're doing the financial literacy, we're doing the, the monthly education services to help people apply for the down payment. You know, we had the mayor to do the down, the $25,000 down payment uh, assistance program. That's been going over well. People are coming in. We're trying, to, we're working, we're doing the education, but I'm also part of a National Association of Real Estate Brokers. So this is our, this, this year will be our fourth year doing a United Developers Council. We have a, uh, one of the entities up under our group is development. So it's for realtors, it's for anybody who's interested. And how do you put these packages together? Who do you contact? How do you collaborate? And how do you get these, you know, get these things going? So what I would like to ask is, if you're available, it's October 16th through the 20th, we really need to get you on our schedule so you can talk about what's happening, talk about what's going. There's a, we're going to have people coming in from around the United States, and these are already, these people are already doing development. So they're looking for projects. They're looking to assist and collaborate and to help people pull these things together, and especially in our cities where I was born and raised in Detroit. I'm here because I want to help my, my, my community in Detroit. Let's talk. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it.
turn this off. Yes, 